Welcome to a new episode of Podcast Bridging Voices, the podcast of the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Brussels. My name is Caroline Lepre, and I'm Program Manager for Democracy and Sustainable Development. In today's episode, we will talk about the protest under the slogan End SARS in Nigeria, a leaderless movement that took to the streets to demonstrate against police brutality starting on October 8th. We will discuss what led to the protests and what made them escalate. We will also reflect on what long-term impacts they will have and what the Nigerian government and international actors can do to de-escalate the situation. I am very happy to be joined by our two guests today. With me are Vladimir Krek, head of the CAS office in Nigeria, and Simisola Aremo, who is a developer and product designer from Lagos, who has participated in the protests and can provide us with first-hand insights. So straight into the discussion, Vladimir, let me ask you, how do you perceive the political climate in Nigeria at the moment? And what are the main concerns leading to the protests? Well, uh, to understand the protests, we have to look at the broader context and conditions in Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria faces a number of very serious challenges. Uh, due to COVID-19, the country entered a uh, second recession within years. Unemployment, underemployment increases, um, and um, around 50% of the uh, population, meaning um, more or less 100, 100 million people, uh, live in extreme poverty. In addition, the country faces uh, a, a number of uh, very serious security threats, uh, of course, uh, first and foremost, the insurgency in the Northeast, the fight against Boko Haram and the Islamic State West Africa province. Uh, in the Northwest, we have armed banditry in a very large scale that destabilizes the region. Um, in the Middle Belt, we still have farmer surders clashes, uh, very violent with uh, casualties, and uh, the South is uh, characterized by robbery and uh, kidnappings. Last but not least, uh, Nigeria has been coping for many, many years with a widespread corruption that uh, reduces the possibility of the country in terms of funds and state revenues uh, to develop. Um, it is actually against this backdrop that we have to say uh, the government was not very successful uh, recently in cushioning the economic effects of COVID-19, uh, fighting uh, crime and terrorism and uh, tackling the uh, corruption. So many, many people and especially young people are uh, dissatisfied with the current situation in the country. And I believe that uh, the protests against police brutality are in fact a symptom or an expression of this dissatisfaction with the socioeconomic conditions. Um, especially young people are also tired of uh, bad governance, they're tired of corruption, uh, they're tired of state authorities that overstep their rights or violate human rights in the country. So we have seen a number of protests that started as protests against a Nigerian police unit called the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, or in short, SARS. But even though the government announced the dissolution of SARS rather quickly on October 11th, we have seen the protests continue with even bigger demands, including a structural overhaul of the security apparatus and justice for victims. There have been accusations of nepotism, of corruption and mismanagement, as Vladimir mentioned, and all these aspects giving ground on the police officers not being held accountable for their actions. Simi, I would like to hear your opinion on how are the government and the political elites perceived by the protesters? And what can the government effectively do at this stage to assure that their voices are being heard? Okay, thank you. Um, the challenge I think with the with the leadership of the country and the political elites and the way the protesters are viewing um, them is their credibility, the credibility of um, the authorities. I think partly because of the previous antecedents set by uh, previous governments and partly also by their poor mismanagement of um, current issues, socioeconomic issues like Vladimir mentioned uh, in the country at the moment many citizens don't trust or believe that the authorities or politics in Nigeria 
is sincere to the extent that he cares about the well-being of his citizens. Uh, for example, the protest, the, 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 every Nigerian has a right to protest and a right for their collective voices to be heard when they're displeased. And while the leadership um, had agreed to listen, and they said they agreed to listen to the protest, their reactions shown otherwise, such things as intimidation, freezing bank accounts of peaceful protesters. I mean, this, the, the actions show that, um, that they are not actually listening. And for the government to show that they are listening or that they, the voices of the protesters are being heard, they should be truthful. The first thing is to be, is to be truthful and open um, uh, about their processes to assure that the voices of the protesters are being heard. The government needs to stop intimidation. They need to stop intimidating peaceful protesters and be clear and open to their citizens. The officials that have been accused of police brutality need to be tried and prosecuted without further delay. I mean, the delays are, too, are just too much. The trials in the competent court must be done openly and justice needs to be served without any more delays. So I understand that the government has adopted a two-pronged strategy where on the one hand, they try to show protesters that they are listening and in this way, stop the protests. But at the same time, they are harassing citizens by freezing bank accounts and using intimidation against activists. How much trust do you think the Nigerian people actually have in the intention of their government to bring about real change? The presidential panel um, said that it okayed the five demands that were given by the youth during the NSAS movement. Um, the Nigerian citizens, as I mentioned earlier, have a history of distrust and weariness in the Nigerian leadership because we've been burned too many times. And the actions of freezing bank accounts and preventing movements out of the country and arresting citizens only enforces the distrust that the government isn't listening. I mean, the authorities uh, during the NSAS, at the, at the crux of the NSAS movement, which was uh, October 20th, um, when the massacre happened in Lekki, uh, the authorities, including the army, spent a ridiculous amount of time discrediting the truth as fake news. I mean, just plain denying the events of violence targeted at peaceful protesters that took place over the last week. CNN released the reports on their investigation on the NSAS protest and it revealed that key eyewitnesses were offered money to recount their statements. And we have had fresh reports um, that recent arrests and detentions have been made of peaceful protesters and protesters have had to seek going to hiding or seek asylum. This is completely unacceptable. And it further proves the point that the Nigerian citizens find it difficult to trust in the credibility of what the government is saying what the government promises to do or promises to say that says that is, is going to do it, it it discredits the it discredits it and it makes it makes the nigerian citizens distrust what they have to say or distrust what they say they're going to do so so i, I don't think majority of the nigerians because of the actions of the government are able to trust and believe that the government is going to do what it said it would do you mentioned the Lekki Tollgate massacre, and you also mentioned the CNN report. Could you walk us through what happened exactly? So on October 20th, uh, in the evening of October 20th, the first thing we, we heard of, uh, prior to then, we had been having um, uh, protests in specific locations. For example, I was at the protest and, at Alausa, Alausa, where the uh, Lagos government's head of house is. Uh, and Lekki Tollgate is a prime location leading to a, uh, an affluent area in Lagos. On the 20th of October, um, in the evening, early evening, 5, 5 p.m., we saw reports that, alleged reports that um, the cameras at the toll gate had been removed. Towards the eve, towards 6 p.m., past 6 p.m., um, the lights at the toll gate, which are never turned off, were turned off. And between to seven and late into the night, we heard gunshots. There were gunshots and fired at, at peaceful protesters. I mean, 
after that day, when reports came out and the army was, was because it was the army that was there, and then afterwards, police officials, the SARS police officials, after they were queried, they simply denied it. They said it was fake news. They said they were firing. In fact, initially, they said they weren't there. Then they said it was fake news. I mean, their reports were just all over the entire place, which didn't make sense because we had eyewitness reports. We had videos. We had records of this thing happening. People were killed. People were shot at, people were murdered at Lekki toll gates. So to come and say that it is a fake news, to come and gaslight an entire population of Nigerians that this didn't happen is playing on the intelligence of Nigerians. So it enforces the fact that Nigerian citizens don't entirely trust in the credibility of the government. The discussions around SARS are not really new. The Nigerian government has since 2017 repeatedly pledged to stop SARS or introduce changes to its operation, but has always returned back to the status quo in the end. Is there a difference this time? Yes, I think there is a difference. Um, and uh, the difference is um, especially to be explained uh, with the socioeconomic conditions in the country right now. Uh, I believe, first of all, the government was uh, completely overwhelmed and very much surprised by the dynamics, the scale and the persistence of the protests. Um, at the same time, we have to uh, look into the socioeconomic background of the country that especially inflation has uh, increased quite a lot uh, over the past month. Uh, we have price hikes uh, of basic uh, goods, uh, for instance, fuel or energy. Uh, so people really suffer. People fight for their survival. And uh, I believe that the uh, government was very much afraid that the protests and the scale of protests uh, will not only turn against um, or has turned against police brutality, but will also turn against them. And uh, what actually happened also was over time, you could see that the protests developed further. All of a sudden, young people were protesting against bad governance. They were protesting against uh, corrupt elites. And uh, I believe that that the government had to take this decision very quickly to accommodate the protesters and to decide to um, uh, dissolve NSARS in order to satisfy them and to stop the protests in time. Yes, you mentioned the government being overwhelmed by the size of the protests, which indeed were unprecedented. Simi, let me ask you, do you think that in this highly polarized political climate, we will see long-term effects in the run-up to the general election in 2023. And maybe you could also tell us how you see your own prospects as a young professional in Nigeria at the moment. Most definitely. I think that there is a widespread political awareness among the youth, especially youth that came out to protest. I mean, you mentioned the size and the magnitude of the protest was unprecedented and it overwhelms the government. Um, I think that the political awareness, um, the youth that are agitating for uh, registration of voters card now, rather than a few months to vote in date, um, the youth that were really politically naive or just apathetic about politics um, because of the, the disinterest or the credibility of the politics, are suddenly aware or are insistent on good governance. And I think that the exposure of technology and the belief in the power of numbers has helped. And I think that is going to have a solid impact on the 2023 general elections. As a professional, I think it has brought home to me the fact that growth and development of the country has been stunted because for the most part, the right decisions have not been made. Um, and I think for, the, for, for, for some part of it, it's, it has to do with the, with the best citizens not being in leadership, best citizens in terms of innovators, professionals, social workers, empathetic citizens are not being, are not in the helm of things and in, in the helm of affairs that I think would be able to transform the state of the country from its deep poverty state or bring it out of that deep poverty state. Like Vladimir mentioned, Nigerians are suffering and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be really.
We have seen the international community condemning the violence and calling the Nigerian authorities to de-escalate the situation, but also, very importantly, respect human rights and the rule of law. To both of you, maybe the question, what are your recommendations to the international community, to international actors, such as the European Union, such as the United Nations, to successfully support the efforts by the Nigerian government to find a peaceful solution to this conflict? I feel the international community, as it has condemned the violence, and as it has called out the Nigerian authorities to de-escalate the situation and respect the human rights, I think it can mount further pressure on the Nigerian authorities to continue to affect the rule of law. And it can identify uh, the, those that are involved in the clampdown of peaceful protesters uh, within the authorities and including the authorities that have been accused and found guilty of violating Nigerian human rights and deny them visa or revoke their existing visa into Europe. I think that it can also introduce policies that make it difficult for Nigerian authorities or officials to wire or keep unexplained funds in European banks or invest in real estate in Europe. Uh, I think that the international community can do these things to mount further pressure or block ways in which they can exit the country, they can cause a problem and exit the country. I think that the international community can do that. Vladimir, I pass the floor to you. Um, do you have any inputs on recommendations for international actors at the moment? Yes, of course. I very much have to agree with uh, Simi that there is right now an impression that the uh, Nigerian government tries to cover up uh, for what happened at the uh, Loki, uh, Leki toll gate. And um, the European Union is often uh, considered as a normative power in the world that promotes democracy, that promotes good governance, that promotes human rights. And I think that this normative power must become again more visible in Nigeria in a form of demands of a quick and proper investigation of the Lekki Tollgate incident, uh, especially in the demand of explanations. Uh, who shot at the protesters? Uh, how many died? And especially who is responsible? And that those who are responsible uh, should be brought to justice. Um, secondly, I think that the European Union and also the member states of the European Union are um, probably together the biggest donor or one of the biggest donors in Nigeria in terms of development cooperation. And uh, looking at many of the concepts, and right now the European Union uh, has started to design also the new national indicative plan or program for Nigeria, um, we need to put more emphasis on democratic governance, we need, need to put more emphasis on good governance, we need to put more emphasis in the fight against corruption in order to give this government the opportunity to win back its credibility. I think that's the only way that young people and the rather older elites in Nigeria can be reconciled. Yes, I think these are very important last words uh, to the international community more emphasis on good governance, more emphasis on the fight against corruption, and of course, more emphasis on democracy. With this, I would like to close our session today. We at the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue will closely follow the pro-democracy movement, the pro-human rights movement, the pro-good governance movement in Nigeria that we see. I would like to thank both of you for being with us today, sharing these first-hand insights from Nigeria. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for updates on our work. You can find the links in the description. We are looking forward to seeing you again at our next podcast episode.